The highway to happiness. I remember it was 25 years ago, I was at seminary, and it was um, my first semester. I'd been a youth pastor here in Lloydminster, and and went down to Cochrane, and we were there, and, and I'd preached in my church up here, but there I didn't get a lot of opportunities. So one day they're like, yeah, we're looking for someone to go to Pitcher Creek this week. And so I'm like, okay, I'll go to Pitcher Creek, right? Yeah. So Lisa and I drove down to Pitcher Creek, and we came to this, this hotel ballroom where they had set up these chairs, and they were like a foot apart and like six rows. And so there, you know, there was not a lot of chairs, but they kind of wanted to make the room look full. Like, that's interesting. And there was probably about 30 people in the room, which was awesome. So, we, you know, we're having this, we're singing, it's kind of like we did here today. And then, and then just before I got up to speak, they're like, okay, now we're going to dismiss the children and the workers. And pretty much everyone got up and left, except for seven people, including my wife, right? So, so now there I am preaching to seven people. So there was a lot of awkward eye contact during that sermon, just so you know. So, so if you feel that way today, understand that's just not the reality. It's just the reality. There's fewer of you, so I'm going to probably catch your eye at some point in the sermon. So don't, I'm not really thinking about you when I do that. It's just the nature of, of life. And um, there we go. No, it's... It's weird. I'm not back in the rhythm of two services, but thank you all that volunteered. Some people stepped up to take on extra duties today and so glad. And, and we just want to continue to share the good news here in Lloydminster. But today we're talking about the highway to happiness. Uh, Jesus begins his first sermon in Matthew's gospel. Matthew, who was a first century contemporary with Jesus, who saw Jesus, who knew Jesus, he, he writes this gospel for us today so that we can kind of learn about Jesus. And he says, yeah, the very first sermon, this is what he starts with, this idea of happiness, blessed. And it's, verse 4, a unexpected stop on that journey. But we're going to start at verse 1 of chapter 5 and just see what is Jesus, how does he lead into this sermon? And it says in verse 1, when he saw the crowd, that is Jesus, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them by saying, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. So then the first word out of Jesus' mouth, blessed. Uh, it could be translated blissfully happy or oh the blessedness or oh the happiness it's more than just an external feeling that's tied to outward circumstances it's something much deeper than that um communicators commentary would say that it's the happiness that belongs only to god and comes only from god and when in your life you share in these qualities you will discover this happiness and so he says when you're at the end of your rope as eugene peterson would say you discover that the kingdom of heaven is at your disposal. When you recognize your spiritual inadequacy, you can discover God's provision for your needs. And that's where he starts the sermon, verse 3. But today we're looking at verse 4, which is this one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It seems like a really weird blessing. Oh, it's like happy are the unhappy. Happy are the people that are, are sad, and it seems like, because we, we think of mourning, this is what we think of, you're, you're sad. I mean, let's do an informal survey here. Okay, who in this room has lost someone close to them? Uh, just don't raise your hands. Yeah, just think about it. Now, I'm not speaking someone distantly, but someone that you had regularly, weekly contact with. If you've lost someone that close to you, put your hand up here. Let's see. So you see, all of us, good over half of us, have been affected by loss. And if you haven't, you will. I remember as a 27-year-old man getting the call that my dad had cancer. I was actually north of town here with my in-laws. And, and like, I just remember getting off the phone and just like weeping because I was like, my dad is going to die. It's all over his stomach. And we drove to BC. And then for the next several months, that was a monthly trip, you know. And, and basically, I'm watching my dad die in front of my eyes. And I'm mourning the whole time. And while this is happening, my wife is pregnant. Life is growing in her womb. And my dad is slowly shrinking. I'm just like, and, and I'm mourning. And then he died. And, and then I really mourned. And those of you that have lost loved ones, you know that. Sometimes it just comes with on it like a flood, and it could be 25 years later, 20 years later, and you're like, oh, I still feel this. And Jesus says, you're blessed if you mourn. If you feel that pain and that loss. And, of course, Proverbs, and, I mean, Solomon in Ecclesiastes says this in chapter 7. I don't have it on the screen, but just listen to what Solomon says. He says, a good name is better than precious perfume. Likewise, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. It's better to go to a house of mourning 
than to a house of drinking, for death is the destiny of every person, and the living should take this to heart. Sorrow was better than laughter, because sober reflection is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of merry making. It's, it's kind of weird. But there's a sense of when you understand your mortality and the shortness of life, I think you hold precious the, 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 the blessings that God brings in your life. And even if you talk to pastors, a lot of them will say, yeah, I'd much rather do a funeral than a wedding, which is really weird, but it's, it makes sense, right? Because it, it reflects that idea of like, yeah, people actually have your attention. No one comes to a wedding to hear my sermon, right? I, mean, I told a guy that. He was calling me this, this last semester. He was like doing a pastoral ministry assignment. I'm like, keep your sermon short because no one cares what you say at a wedding. But at a funeral, they're, they're, they're keen to hear what you have to say about this. And here Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, I have a picture here of these mourners. These are professional mourners. Like, those are people you really don't want to invite to your birthday party, right? There, there they are, you know. They're not looking, but, you know, they, they would be often hired to, to, to come to your graveside, to follow the procession, to, to wail, to sing sad songs. And, and, and maybe this is the image that comes to your mind. This is what I, I was thinking of when I think about, about mourning. But it's, there's this solemnness about life and death that Jesus says, you know, we, we embrace this as kingdom people. We don't shrink from it. In our world, people don't want you to talk about death. In fact, if you look at the paper on any given week, there will be a number of obituaries will just say, no service at request of the deceased. That people think that when they die and tell their family not to have a service, they're doing them a favor. But Jesus says, no, no, you're blessed actually when you mourn. When you embrace the life and death cycle of, of life and, and find me in the midst of that, God says, then, then you could find blessing. Otherwise, yeah, forget about death, forget about mourning, for, you, know, like, like, you know, and that's the common thing in reality is people just want to, you know, okay, let's forget about someone died, let's forget about the body, let's just kind of move on and, and pretend it didn't happen. It did happen. And if you went through loss, you feel it. And if you accept the world's idea of like, oh, just, just ignore it, you'll carry this grief with you. But Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Warren Wiersbe has said this, if you want to know a person's character, find out what makes him laugh and what makes him weep, which is a reflection of, of Ecclesiastes 7. What makes you laugh? What makes you weep? And Jesus touches into the, the point of, of, of feeling in our hearts that we all will experience at some point in our life this idea of mourning. He says, this morning is actually a source of happiness, of blissful happiness, if you embrace it in, in the right context. And so, in light of that, I just want to talk a little bit about mourning, or sorrow. Because there are kind of three pictures of sorrow in the Bible. There's the idea of natural sorrow. This is just normal, everyday grieving. This is, uh, it's not sinful, it's a gift from God. It's that, as, as Wiersbe would say, natural sorrow expressed in mourning releases a healing process in a person's life that enables him or her to accept the pain, work through it, and adjust to life again. Uh, natural sorrow is an expression of love, right? So when you're at the graveside and there's the widow or the widower and the children and they're crying as you drop the casket into the ground, I mean, that's a good thing. That's part of the healing process. Natural sorrow. There is unnatural sorrow where you get stuck in the process. Uh, it's the, it's what, when the opposite of what God wants to happen happens in your life. Like uh, godly sorrow heals, but unnatural sorrow makes the wounds deeper, fills the heart with pain. Natural sorrow gladly helps us put life back together again, but unnatural sorrow tears things apart and keeps them that way, right? So people get stuck. Have you ever met someone that's stuck? Maybe, maybe, maybe you're stuck today where you had a, a bad experience or a bad loss or something happened and then, and then you just you get stuck in bitterness and, and, and you don't grow through that and, and you, just, you, you hold on to the pain instead of, instead of letting it go as you work through the grief. Um, and, and we can all, like, so you got fired from a job and you've never ever gotten past that. You're stuck in the grief of losing that job or maybe you had a spouse that left you. 
and abandon you and, and, and cause all sorts of grief for your life moving forward because of that abandonment. And you, and you haven't let that go and you, you hold on to that grief and you're stuck in this unnatural sorrow or unnatural mourning where you really haven't moved on. Or maybe it, it is someone that has died in your life and, and maybe you're mad at God because how could he do that? And you just can't let God off the hook on that and, you, and you're holding on to the bitterness and, the, and, and, you, you know, and, and, and you're stuck, you're stuck, you're stuck. Unnatural sorrow, unnatural grief. The quote is this, the sorrows of life do not create problems, they reveal them. And so you and I, all through our lives, encounter these speed bumps on the highway to happiness. And Jesus says, blessed are you when you mourn, because you will discover comfort. And none of times, when you're in those times of pain and loss and, and, and feeling the suffering of the world in which we live, you're like, it doesn't feel like a happy moment, but Jesus said, it is a blessing to grow through those and to discover God's comfort in those times. The last one is, of course, the, the supernatural sorrow. Jesus is talking about repentance for sin, and that is the result of the supernatural work of God in your life. There is that morning when you come to the realization that you don't measure up to God's standards. And that you in your heart have the ability to do some really bad things, right? It's when you're a kid and you realize that, yeah, you know, I probably shouldn't have beat up my little sister. or I shouldn't have stole that candy from the candy store or whatever. And you begin to mourn the fact that, how come I do these things? Why did I lie? Why did I cheat on that test? You know, and, and, and it, gets, it just kind of expands as you become an adult. You know, why, why, you know, why do I just, you know, gossip about people? Why, why do I turn the computer on and look at pornography? You know, why, why do I want to go and then just drink when, when life gets tough? You know, why do I have these challenges? And then, then your heart began to feel the sorrow of, why do I do that? And then you come to God and say, you know, I need your forgiveness. I need to be right with you. And these habits that I have that are, just seem to be inherent to my nature are, are dragging me down. And the mourning is you acknowledging your sinfulness and, and finding God's cleansing in that moment. It's not moaning. Blessed are those who moan. Because there are people that have suffering and difficulty and they just want to tell everyone about it. But it is true mourning. And, and this is what Pentecost would say. The biblical concept of mourning is recognizing a need and then presenting that need to the God of comfort. I've got this and I can't fix it on my own, but I know I'm bringing it to you. And, and the first need, of course, is I'm a sinner and, and I, I can't get right with you because I, I, I'm imperfect. And, and Jesus says, you can get right with me through me because I died on the cross and I rose again. Sanders has said, the primary form of sore envisioned here is mourning over one's own sin and spiritual failure. That's kind of the first step on the highway to happiness is you saying, I'm a sinner, I need God's forgiveness, and, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, I, I really am. Like, I, I don't, I'm not proud of it, and, I'm, and I want to move forward, and I want to find comfort on the other side of this. And, and, and that forgiveness is comfort, like Isaiah, I mean Elijah read in, in, in Psalm 32 there. I have a picture here. In the old revival days, they had these benches in the church called the mourner's bench. And so as the preacher, Charles Finney, or any revivalist would preach the gospel and call people to repent and to confess their sins, if you were under conviction, you would stand up and you would come and you would sit on the mourner's bench here and, you know, everyone would be like, oh, look, you know, God's working in Mike's heart. I guess he's ready to, to get right with the Lord. And you'd sit on the bench or you'd come to that area. And so, so there used to be, be like a real physical location in the church. Now, we don't do that in New Life. We're not going to single you out. But the truth is, like, there is a place where you can come and meet with God and get right with God. The challenge is, and we can get back to the verse there, is, you know, we, we mourn on a personal level, but then Jesus invites us to mourn on, on a bigger level than that. To mourn that we live in a world like this. When you watch the news, when you see difficulties, and to actually feel and, and, and to have concern for the, for the reality of, of, of sin in our world and how it affects people and cultures and societies and individuals. But sometimes if we're so self-focused, we kind of miss that. Uh, e. Stanley Jones has said this, that most people are so taken up with themselves and their own problems that, they, that the world's pain and the sorrow cannot get to them. And it's a real dangerous place when you get to the place where you no longer feel the effect of sin in the world. Right? Um, I remember just a couple weeks ago, I was in the um, 
Domino's Pizza parking lot. I ordered some pizza, I was picking it up, and there's a guy kind of just slinking around the parking lot there. And you know, and, you, know you, you have all sorts of thoughts, but you're just like, okay, well, who knows? But he, he seemed to be looking for something or trying to, you know, see if there was you know, whatever. I mean, you know, and just, you know, and, and, you know, all, like I said, all thoughts going through my mind. I came to my car, I put the pizza in, and, and it was just like, Mike, go give that guy a piece of pizza, right? So I, I took a piece of pizza out and, and I go, hey, and he's, he's like, oh, you know, like he was like scared. I'm like, no, I just want to give you a piece of pizza, you know? And so, because in that moment, what, 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 how could I help that guy? I mean, I don't know what he was looking for food, what he was looking for. I mean, he was obviously, you know, not, not at home, not in a warm place, but I'm like, I can give you something that I have. Here it is. Boom. And it's like, I gave him a piece of pizza, right? Because I'm like, obviously, he's, he's, he's looking for something. And what could I give him that moment as a piece of pizza, right? But, but the, the reality is, is that people around us are, are living in the same world we are. And God comforts us in our sinfulness, and he helps us to comfort those who are affected by the sin of the world. Um, Mounts has said this, the, those who mourn are not simply those who have gone through difficult times, but those who understand that all suffering in the world stems from sinful and self-destructive human tendency to act as if God did not exist. And the truth is, the world doesn't offer us a whole lot when it comes to suffering, right? If you, if you lived in, in, in the most populated areas of our, of our world, you would find that there is no actual answer to this. Uh, in some cultures, they would say, well, the will of Allah is, is supreme, and he does what he wants, and, you, and it is what it is. Someone's suffering, well, that's their fate. In other parts of the world, they'll say, well, you know, the way to, to escape suffering is to pretend that it doesn't exist, to, to recognize that it's an illusion. And tell a, a mom that's lost her baby through a miscarriage that that's an illusion, the pain you're experiencing isn't real. Of course it's real. The Hindu would say, well... Live your life, and hopefully next one you'll get a better op- opportunity than you have this time. And so you're born into it. That is what it is. Hopefully next time you'll, you'll come back in a better place, and you can, you know, kind of get a reset, and then maybe you'll get another reset. And, but it is what it is. Tough luck. And then Christ comes in and says, I'm going to enter into the world of suffering and suffer. And through my suffering, I'm going to bring comfort to everyone who believes in me. And then after I ascend into heaven, I'm going to send the comforter, who is the Holy Spirit. And then through my people, my disciples, they will bring comfort to the world. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Because that's the idea of comfort. Uh, the word comfort is actually to be encouraged or to, to provide strength or, or support. It's not just sympathy. It's not just someone saying, oh, it's too bad. It's someone actually who's stepping into the, into the mess with you and helping you out of it. Uh, some of you um, maybe have, have had friends like that that actually encourage you in your times of deep loss. But, but then there's other people that just want to send flowers to the funeral or drop a card in, in the basket and then they're done. I'm reading about the, the mourning customs of, of the Jewish people, and like, um, you would come and you would sit with the person, uh, sometimes for a whole week, and you don't say anything to the person until they speak to you, so you just sit there in silence. It's, it's, it's ministry through presence. Uh, in, the, in the ancient Near East, I mean, you, you would, someone would die, they would get him in the ground pretty quick, or her in the ground, and then, and then you would continue the mourning process. You would go back to the house. The immediate neighbors, it was their responsibility to bring food to the house. And then you would just sit there. Until they speak to you, you wouldn't say a word. You just sit there, and you, you sit there, and you encourage, and you buy your presence. And then they, if they said something, then you could respond, but you just sat there. You read the book of Job. Job's friends sit with Job for seven days. He's in the ash heap, you know, scratching himself with pot. You know, there he is, and, 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 they're, and they're just sitting with him. Most of us don't even want to take a day off to go to some friend's funeral or some friend's parent's funeral. Most of our employers wouldn't want to give us the day off to do that. But Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. I mean, how many times I've been in a funeral procession and people are cutting off the hearse? I'm like, seriously, people? But this is our culture. You used to stop. You used to take off your hat. You used to kind of, you know, let let the procession go by. Now people are are running, you know, cutting you off, trying to get in front of you, you know. And, and, And here Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn because... They will be comforted. Now, understand, that is future tense. 
There is comfort we have now in terms of knowing we're forgiven and all this stuff, but we still live in this sinful, suffering world. We still feel the pain all the time, and it comes in waves, but we look forward to that day of comfort. But in receiving God's comfort, uh, we are able to help share comfort with others. I have this quote here, the most absolutely, oh, sorry, mourning sin in your life or the collective sin at large in the culture or the body of Christ enables you to draw near to God, to, to experience this. But then let's go to that next quote there. The most absolutely happy people on earth are those who choose to care till it hurts. The most miserable people on earth are those who center on themselves and deliberately shun the care of others in the interest of their own happiness. I mean, I think you want to be happy. According to Jesus, and as Jones says here, it's those who care until it hurts. Of course, like Jesus gets that, right? <laughs> I mean, he, he models this for us. I'm willing to hurt so that you can find comfort. And then Jesus says, I'm sending you into this hurtful world so you can bring my comfort to others. It's surprising how serving and caring for others can actually minister to your own soul. You may think that you're the one, you know, you're going there to, to give, but then it's amazing how you receive when you do that. It's a blessing, kind of a reverse sort of blessing. But if you're always just worried about your own stuff, your own things, your own needs, you miss out on this opportunity for incredible happiness. I mean, I've, I've seen people... Um, one lady, she just was always in this moaning, kind of like, ah, oh, my life is horrible, this, that, blah, blah, blah. And I said, why don't you invite some people over to your home, invite some ladies over, serve them tea, you know, let their, you know, ask them questions. And she just couldn't do that because she couldn't get out of that, that moaning. And, 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 and here there's the opportunity to receive blessing and happiness when we care for others. There was a nun that worked in a school in India and taught kids, and, but she kept seeing all these poor castaway people in, in, the, in the Indian culture. And finally she said, i got to do something about this. And so uh, Sister Teresa <laughs> started this new order that just cared for all these derelict, dying people, lepers, you know, the, the lowest of the low. She would literally go to the garbage dump and to the gutters and, and pick people up and bring them to her home where they could, you know, get some care and then die in dignity. Mother Teresa would say, never worry about the numbers. Help one person at a time and always start with the person nearest you. I mean, is there someone close to you that needs comfort that God can use to bring his comforting presence into their life? She says, don't wait for leaders. Do it alone, person to person. Calcuttas are everywhere. If only we have eyes to see, find your Calcutta. God invites us to not only to receive his comfort as we mourn our own sin, but now to be agents of comfort in our world, to bring comfort to those who need it. So here's uh, some implications. Blessing comes when I feel the pain of my own sin and turn to God for forgiveness, right? So blessed are those who mourn. I am not the person that, that God created me to be because of my sin. And I, and I don't want to keep it in sin. So when you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So, so blessing comes when, when I realize this and, and I discover his forgiveness. Two, blessing comes when I feel the effects of sin in my world and I'm moved to do something about it. God didn't put us here just to, to watch and say, oh, well, that's too bad, I guess. But he in, invites us to actually engage with the pain, to step into the mud puddle and to help and to bring comfort to our world. Number three, God comforts us when we mourn so that we can comfort others in their mourning. Maybe you've been through grief and mourning in your life. And, and God can use that to, to minister to others. I've, we've got friends over at FBC that run this thing called Grief Share, and both, you know, our, our friends have, have both lost spouses, and so they're using that experience to help encourage and, and guide and comfort those that are going through loss in their own lives. And so it's been, it's been a real great ministry. And so you can, God can use the pain and the suffering of your life to help you to minister to others. It's not a loss. It can actually be a great gain. And this is an opportunity for you to, to comfort those in their morning. Losing my dad at 27, 
uh, made me a better pastor. I wouldn't want, I, I wish I could go back and reset that and, and still have them. But I understood death at a level that I didn't understand it before that. I could talk about it, you know, as a concept. But now I'm like, yeah, I, I know what it's like to lose someone you love. Yeah, I do. And it helped me to comfort those that I lost loved ones as I pastored these last decades. Um, I know we'd all want to have those loved ones back, but God uses that pain. If you lost a child, you can help those that lose children, right? You lost a, you know, a spouse or whatever the case may be. You, you can minister to those in their mourning. Uh, number four, Holy Spirit, the divine comforter, is your greatest resource in finding and sharing comfort with others. So here's the reality. You and I don't have the resources to really be the best comforters. We, we can kind of do our best and try, but God empowers you with this comforter. And as you receive comfort, you're enabled to, to share comfort with those that are in need. And so this week, you may have someone in your life that needs comfort. You maybe are going through mourning in your own life for whatever reason that may be. There may be some bad experience that you're mourning. It may be that divorce, that law, job loss. You're, you're mourning, you know, who knows what. But God invites you to, to grow through it and then to share and minister to others in their need. I'm going to invite the team up. They're going to lead us in a closing song here. Uh, it is an unexpected stop on the journey to happiness. I, I know it's a serious topic. I'm, I'm not trying to make light of it. But the beauty of it is that we have a God that entered into our pain. He entered into our suffering. He embraced the, the, the world that we live in so that we, we could, one, be forgiven, but also bring comfort to, within this world. And he invites us to do something and, 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 to, and to experience this blessing as we mourn our own sin, but then as we help others who are mourning to find the comfort that only God can provide. Would you pray with me as we close? And if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, I, I just I always want to make that opportunity available. You can believe in Jesus Christ today. He died and rose again for you to have a new life. And you can just acknowledge that, yeah, you know what? I, I've blown it, and, and, and there's, there's a sin in my life, but I, I recognize that when I mourn over my sin, when, when I acknowledge it, that you're able to forgive it. And you can find his forgiveness today and find eternal life that Jesus promises to all those who believe in Jesus Christ. Lord, would you open our eyes to our community, to the hurting people, to the sinful situations and, and, the, and the effects of sin and the people around us and enable us to bring your comfort to those places, to our school where there's hurting kids, to the workplace, to the gym, to the ice rink, to the places where we do commerce and business. In all these places, Lord, may you work in us so that we can bring your comfort to those places. Help us to look at our world and see the pain and, and, not, and, and, and feel it and understand that Christ came to, 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 so that we could have a better world. And we look forward to the day when there will be ultimate comfort with you in heaven. And so thank you for this truth and this, this beatitude. May we live it out this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand with the team as we, as we sing.